Gators Breakdown. Because there's never a dull moment in Gator Nation. The Gators Breakdown Podcast is ready to go. I'm your host, David Waters, and you can find me on Twitter at GatorDave underscore SCC. Another jam-packed episode this week, and joining me as always is co-host Will Miles. You can find him on Twitter at Will Miles SCC. Will, how's it going? Man, we're starting to go a little bit stir crazy up here. It's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're we're all fortunate to be happy and healthy up here, but uh, you know, <laughs> obviously, I'm sure everybody is sort of in the same boat that it's. Uh, it, it, there's a feeling that we'd like to get back to normal and certainly by August, we want to make sure we're back to normal for the reasons that everybody tunes into this podcast, but we're doing all right up here. All right. And uh, joining us this week is special guest, Neil Blackman from Saturday down South. You may have caught his uh, article this past week, uh, talking the importance and the opportunity Florida has uh, against those pesky Georgia Bulldogs uh, coming up this season. But Neil, I had to get you on, you know, uh, um, our, our hate for the uh, red and black cannot be measured, and uh, you and I have put that out there enough. But uh, with that article, I definitely had to bring you on here. Yeah, thanks for thanks for having me, Dave. And um, yeah, I mean, it's funny we've gotten to this point in, in journalism now where you know it's okay to just kind of admit open as long as you're open about your biases, it's, it's cool. <laughs> so I've never I'm never shy about uh, I don't try to push an anti Georgia narrative at all, but but I don't, I don't hide my contempt. Absolutely, absolutely, guys. Uh, crazy thing is, we should be previewing the spring game right now. Yeah. The, 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 you know, Saturday would be this coming up. Saturday would be the uh, Florida spring game, and here we are. Um, you know, now just trying to find creative ways to talk about the, the Gators and, and college football in general. And uh, you know, it's. Uh, a, a lot, a lot of SEC teams were going to be hosting their spring games uh, this weekend, but uh, here we are. We know we're not going to have uh, spring football. No, we're not going to have spring games. Who knows when fall camp starts? Uh, but uh, kind of w- when I was putting this episode together, I was like, man, we really should be talking about the upcoming spring game. And uh, would we you know, Saturday? Oh, we're, we're going to get to see Emory Jones more, and uh, that that side of the fan base <laughs> would be happy, and we get to see uh, how these young guys fit in at, at Nickelback and safety and all the position battles. And ah, uh, here we are talking about Florida Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, you, my mom sent me a picture today because a year ago you and I were sitting in the swamp next to each other, Dave, catching the catching the spring game and seeing John Huggins. How long ago was that? Taking back a, a Kyle Trask sort of floater back for a touchdown during the spring game. And, and Chris Steele I, making, making plays in the end zone. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously everything that we talked about leading into the spring game last year came true. And, and so, <laughs> so, I mean, I, that is one of the interesting things, right, is the fact that you don't have the game this year does make you sort of go back and look at the things that that happened last year and 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 the things that we predicted coming into the season. I mean, Felipe Franks was going to have a huge year last year. I think you had Michael P. Ryan in the run for the Heisman at least early on after a huge performance against Miami. And you know, Florida Florida wound up with an eleven and two record, but in a way that was very different than I think most of us thought was going to happen. So um, you know, it's obviously a very different time, very different circumstance here, but. Uh, but but I think I think there's enough. This is one of those teams. And I think Neil, you sort of wrote about this. This is this is one of those teams where there's enough experience that we can sort of project what they're going to do, even if they miss or even with missing the spring practice and potentially a delay to the start of the season. Yeah, I mean, if we want, if we know anything about spring practice, it's that uh, Will Muschamp's wide receivers are always about to to bust out, and <laughs> whatever tweaks he's made to the offense are going to work. Um, and if not, it's on him. But uh, <laughs> I would say, yeah, I mean, look, when you have a more experienced football team, spring football is good, but it's more its more like a process story. It's not about, um, you know, it's not as much about positional battles. There's always going to be some in the spring, but it's not as much about those. It's not about a, when there's schematic continuity, which – you know, it was really a problem at Florida last decade, right? Whether it was position coach overlap or, you know, I joke about Muschamp, but when you have that many offensive coordinators, you install that many systems, you know, that kind of stuff is bad. And it makes, it, it makes, I don't want to say it makes spring football more important. I don't really believe that, but there's a different type of value to spring football with Florida. It's just, 
continuity. Let's go out and get better. Right. And that, to me, it's a sign of stable programs when, when that's the first goal in, in spring football is, hey, let's just get better at what we're doing. We know what our system is. And I think that's kind of what what was facing Florida this spring and what kind of made it interesting because to me that, you know, that was around some last year, but this is really the first time where I felt like Florida's had a very stable program in a long time. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, yeah and uh, a year ago it was – you know, Felipe Franks, Kyle Trask, Embry Jones, even Jalen Jones getting snaps in the spring. And what, you know, none of that, what we saw in the spring game really made much of the storyline in the in the fall. Felipe Franks goes down, Kyle Trask is a starter, Embry Jones doesn't get as much playing time as we thought he would. Jalen Jones is not even there to get playing time. So, I mean, who knows what the, especially with everything that surrounds college football right now and the coronavirus and all that stuff, you know, who knows, you know, if we even would have had a spring game just coming up Saturday, you know, if it, how, how much, you know, and I've always said this about spring, it's more about those, what, 14, 15 practices leading up to the spring game, not so much the spring game. And I know a couple of years ago, uh, Will and I kind of got slaughtered a little bit here. We'll get his breakdown talking about the, <laughs> what do we saw in, in a Florida spring game in Dan Mullen's first season. But uh, look, it, it was, uh, we didn't know what to expect at, at that point. We know not to expect a whole lot uh, in, in spring football, but even then it was, Hey, it's more about those 14 practices, uh, not the spring game itself. So while we're thinking about, you know, just coming up Saturday, that we're going to be missing a, a spring football game. More importantly, we're missing those 14 practices. Yeah, I mean, I, I think two years ago, maybe the word coming out of spring camp was that Van Jefferson was the guy who was really dominating things. And you didn't really see that during the actual during the actual game. But you saw that once the season started, that Jefferson was one of the wide receivers that they were really going to rely on. And and, and similarly, I think last year you, you really sort of heard coming out of spring camp that the offensive line was an area that was going to need some need some improvement. And that was sort of the question that we were answering coming into the season was, did we think that the offensive line was going to be good enough to be able to replace all the guys? And it turned out that they really struggled last year. So it does give you a little bit of an idea of what's going on if, you, if you're listening and paying attention to the narratives coming out of spring practice. But certainly I think the spring game um, under Mullen has been proven to be, you know, divide things up evenly, to have a good time, just sort of show, showcase, give your quarterbacks the ability to feel good about themselves and, and uh, you know, wor- worry about defense later. So, um, you know, but again, it's a, it's a good time. And I think from the standpoint of just being able to, you know, last year I went down with my son. It was the first time he'd ever been to the swamp. And you get those sorts of experiences um, with maybe smaller kids that you might bring that you wouldn't bring to a normal game. So there's sort of the familial aspect of the spring game as well that, that fans are missing out on. Absolutely, absolutely. So plenty, plenty to discuss here on this episode of Gators Breakdown. As I said, we'll get into uh, both these guys. Latest article, Neil, uh, talking about the opportunity Dan Mullen in Florida has coming up uh, this season, the, the season in general, but most importantly focusing in on that Georgia game. And also Will's latest with uh, Jordan Rogers last week, late last week, uh, get it garnering headlines by putting Texas A&M's Kellen Mond uh, maybe beating the SEC's best quarterback. So Will lays out pretty uh, – Pretty telling reason why that's not going to be the case. So <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll get into uh, to that discussion uh, there. But before we do, uh, remember, you can find Gators Breakdown at news4jacks.com slash Gators Breakdown. There you'll find all the Gators Breakdown episodes as well as News 4 Jacks coverage of the Gators. Uh, the latest headline there from News 4 Jacks is you can go read about uh, Brandon James, uh, local Jacksonville products, Brandon James, Tim Tebow being inducted into the Florida Hall of Fame there. Uh, it's a pretty good, pretty good read there. Um, so also check out the podcast, all the podcast platforms out there and on social media, follow the Gators Breakdown on Twitter and Facebook at Gators Breakdown. So Neil, man, um, uh, yeah, last week, Saturday down South, you, uh, laid out, you know, how great of an opportunity it is, uh, for Dan Mullen and Florida in 2020 with everything surrounding missing spring ball for teams in the SEC, uh, particularly Georgia, we just kind of mentioned the experience Florida has coming into this season compared to what, you know, what Georgia's missing uh, year three uh, for, for Dan Mullen, everything, everything kind of surrounding heading into 2020 and why it's such a great opportunity for Florida to take that next step. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, it's funny that the idea for this kind of came from Kirby smart because he did a conference call with, with the media uh, last week and, 
you know, kind of lamented that, that they weren't going to have spring practice. And he said, you know, we, to, to Will's point and, and to your point, Dave, he said, well, we really needed those practices, right? Like they needed them for a bunch of reasons, but you know, whatever you think of, of, of the talent they have back, which is, you know, a lot, um, they're still replacing 10 players who started the bulk of their games on offense. They're also re- overhauling their offensive scheme. If, if Kirby smarts are believed and if, if Todd Munkin's, you know, history, their new offensive coordinator, Todd Munkin, you know, his history is, is to, to light it up, to pitch it around the yard. Um, certainly not something that they've done. They're going to get away from a lot of that power stuff. Uh, I'm sure there'll be an element of that because it's Georgia, but um, you know, so they're installing a new system offensively. They are replacing 10 starters offensively or nine, depending on if you think George Pickens is really a returning starter, I guess you could say he is. Um, And then they're replacing a legendary quarterback. And like, it's fun to go on Twitter and see the takes about Jake Fromm from like, you know, there, there is an element of their fan base that is quote unquote relieved that he's leaving. And to me, that's ludicrous, right? Like uh, three, you know, against Florida, we, we don't need to break it all down, but he's too, he's a blown coverage away from being a national champion and uh, played in a bunch of sec championship games. So uh, historically legendary quarterbacks in this league are tough to replace, right? You know, it's not just Tim Tebow, uh, Cam Newton, um, you know, at, at Alabama, we'll see. We'll see what happens with a post Tua world. I imagine that there's going to be some problems. Joe Burrow is going to be tough to replace. You could go on and on, right? Uh, Danny Werfel. So all of that kind of led me to, to – Smart makes those comments, and I said, yeah, well, that, that coupled with a veteran team, coupled with the loss of spring practice, coupled with the fact that two other things are up in the air, right? The first one being summer conditioning programs. Like in a world without the coronavirus – there's no chance that we're that that an Apple Watch training system is a is a first page <laughs> news story, but it is now because how do you get your conditioning programs in? Um, you know, guys can't get together for seven on seven drills, which would help a new quarterback like Jamie Newman, another factor for Georgia. Uh, and so we don't even know when the season does come back, what summer ball will look like, right? Is it three weeks to just get guys out there running and and active so their bodies are okay to go, or is it two days, right? Um, we don't know any of that. So I just feel like there's a, a little bit of window closing that happened to Georgia on this season, really opens the door for Florida with a fifth-year senior quarterback. Dan Mullen's record with veteran quarterbacks is tremendous, um, whether he was at Florida or Mississippi State. Uh, so, you know, that coupled with a top-10 defense, that I feel like, and I know about you guys, I, I feel like that defense was playing its best football at the end of the season, um, regardless of, of what they're losing um, in John Grenard and, and in David Reese, a, a veteran leader, and C.J. Henderson. So, um, you know, just a, a really big opportunity for the Gators. And then you look at the schedules, and, you know, the scheduling conspiracy theorists are going to have a lot of explaining to do this year because – Florida doesn't have the normal scheduling conspiracy theory, but instead before the cocktail party, Georgia plays Alabama and Auburn. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're going to do that while implementing a new system with a quarterback who, you know, could tear up Elon, but didn't look so great against good football teams. So I just thought it's a really big opportunity for Florida. It's kind of a long winded answer, but <laughs> no. gets into the, gets into the meat and potatoes of kind of what, what I was thinking when I wrote the piece. Yeah, and I'll pose this question about to you guys, and, and I've kind of thought about it myself. And, and I remember bringing it up on, on, on Gators Breakdown when we first learned that spring was going to be delayed. We probably knew at the time we probably weren't going to have a spring practice. You know, you could kind of you know, read the tea leaves there. Will, I'll start with you. Are we For teams like Georgia, LSU, both on Florida schedule, so many changes, so many players gone, replacing coaches, can we make too much out of that? I mean, those teams recruit like crazy. They're always going to be able to fall back on their talent. That's first and foremost. You, you step one in, in college football is go go out there and, and, and get the talent. Are we making too much of Georgia and LSU missing spring practice and those guys really not missing a beat? Well, I mean, I think yes and no, right? I mean, football is football, and you got guys who are talented. They're going to be able to go out and play. 
at the same time, I think that, you know, even in January, before any of the COVID-19 stuff came up, you know, I, I had written an article that talked about 2020 being the time that Mullen really needed to make his make his mark. And it was tied into a lot of the same things that even if everybody had spring practices, because back in January, we had no <laughs> idea that this was going to be coming. Um, it, you know, even if we had spring practices, all the guys that Georgia was going to have to replace on offense, all the guys LSU is going to have to replace, and then the schedule disparity, right? So the, the fact that Florida really is going to be favored pretty significantly in every game except for the Georgia and LSU games, and Georgia and LSU happen to be in 2020, teams are going to be rebuilding. And then, Neil, you pointed out in your article that Georgia has sort of a weird quirk there where they're playing both Auburn and Alabama next year. And Alabama's pretty early in the schedule, if I'm not mistaken. So the you know, by the end of the year, somebody like Newman and some of the young guys who are coming on offense may really be hitting their stride. So, you know, when we see them in October, maybe it's <laughs> or whenever <laughs> the game ends up being, we may end up seeing a different team than Auburn, Alabama see earlier in the season, but at the same time, those SEC games count just as much. So it may give Florida an opportunity to have mm -hmm. a slip up somewhere along the way, just because Georgia is sort of getting its sea legs early in the season because they don't have the opportunity to practice and be more cohesive to start. And, you know, last year, I think everybody sort of looked at Georgia and said, ah, they'll be able to replace their wide receivers. They have plenty of talent. And, you know, the, the common denominator between Fromm and, and his wide, you know, Fromm played well the two years before last year and then took a step back. And the question I would have is, is it Fromm or is it because that they had to replace all of their wide receivers? And I think there's some evidence that that it wasn't necessarily the top two wide receivers that were the problem. It was at the depth that the third and the fourth wide receivers just really weren't as explosive last year as they had been the two previous years. And that really handcuffed Fromm, who, you know, also... You know, I, I agree with what you said, Neil, but at the same time, he is limited, and I think we're going to see that in terms of where he gets taken in the NFL draft. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think we make a lot out of spring practice because at the end of the day, we think that's an advantage for a experienced team. I think it's one of the things that's going to be fascinating coming into the 2020 season is to see whether teams that are more senior laden have the ability to get out of the gate quickly or whether they just have better seasons overall. So, you know, if Clemson with Trevor Lawrence, is that a huge, a huge advantage for them? Um, he's a great player, but obviously the fact that he can just sort of jump in right where he was at the end of last year is going to make a big difference. And, and I suspect there are going to be some teams that struggle that we don't expect to just because they won't have, a, won't have had the opportunity to get in those practices. Yeah. I think, you know, for Florida and we, we got, you guys kind of hit on it there. You have to take advantage of, of drawing Ole Miss and LSU uh, out of the West and um, LSU replacing so much at the same time, as, as you guys mentioned, Georgia draws Alabama, Auburn before they even play Georgia this year, or before they play Florida this year. It's a quirk in the schedule. It's been changed. Uh, Auburn and Georgia no longer play in November. That game got pushed up to October now. Georgia and I believe Tennessee is the November game now for for Georgia. So that's a you know, that's a that's a change this year. So you know, both those games before they even get to Florida, uh, Georgia could have two losses going into the game versus Florida. You know, if, to, either way, to me. Florida must reach that game undefeated. You know, if not, then the season comes down to the, you know, to, to the Georgia game as you, you can't suffer your second loss of the season against them for the third season in a row and then expect to reach the college football playoff. That's just the way it's played out the last two years that way. Florida's had a loss going into the cocktail party. Lose that game, your season's pretty much done as far as reaching the SEC championship game. So, you know, reach that Georgia game undefeated, and, and then you're kind of playing with house money as, as one loss there. I know we don't really want to look at it that way, but one loss to Georgia really doesn't kill you yet. You know, you may need some help getting to the SEC championship game. Uh, if Georgia only has one loss to, to someone else and they'll hold the tiebreaker by beating Florida, uh, but only one loss to a Georgia team would hold a lot of weight. Um, you know, you may even get the benefit of not having to play in an SEC championship game and then that'd be your only loss. Uh, so uh, yeah, at that point, though, you know, uh, the thing is, you know, right now Florida holds perception of not being able to beat Georgia, and that perception has to change. Uh, so go out, beat Georgia. Uh, you know, don't go into November needing help to get to Atlanta. Uh, and with these two teams, you know, it, it shouldn't matter, you know, what else happens uh, as long as they win that game. That, that has to be the mindset for both teams. Anything new? Yeah, I mean, look, uh, I think there, there, there's two things to talk about when, when you talk about the Florida-Georgia game. The first one is um, that because 
of the circumstances surrounding the upcoming season, whenever it happens, this is the kind of game where, you know, Florida should be better situated to win than they've been in the Mullen era or at the end of the McElwain era, of course. So, um, you know, Georgia seniors are going to be trying to go 4 0 against Florida. You don't want that to happen. Um, <clears throat> and then Dan Mullen, you know, gets beat pretty bad by Kirby Smart with what was supposed to be a pretty good Miss State team. Uh, gets, gets, you know, beat year one at Florida in a, re- in a pretty competitive game and then loses a game that, you know, you could argue was more competitive or as competitive. I don't know how you look at last year's game. It depends. Um, the, the final score was more competitive, but I mean, it's about the same. Like Georgia was in control in the middle of the fourth quarter, right, in both years. So Florida has to figure out how to get Georgia real nervous in the fourth quarter other than for a couple of plays, and then they got to figure out a way to win the game. So um, to me, Florida just has so many fewer questions um, ahead of next season, and that's that's when you have to win, right? Um, and, and you know, the comparison I made in my article is a little imperfect uh, to Jim Harbaugh at Michigan. Um, it's imperfect for a couple of reasons. One, Harbaugh's offensive system is kind of plotting and, and uh, very predictable. Uh, in my opinion, and in a lot of smarter football people's opinion, people know football way better than me. Uh, so, you know, there's that. Uh, there's also, but the, but there's also a, a lot of truth to the fact that Harbaugh recruits pretty darn well, uh, tends to max out talent or come close to maxing out talent, even with his kind of stolid, predictable offensive scheme. Uh, some of that has to do with his defense uh, and his coordinator, who's who's elite. Um, but, you know, look. They came a yard or two short of beating Urban Meyer in Ohio State early in the Harbaugh tenure, and now the gap seems wider than ever, right? And so what does it mean if Florida loses to Georgia for a third straight year? Because there's some things we know for sure. Kirby Smart's recruiting juggernaut, that's not going anywhere, right? They're going to keep – even if Florida recruits better, Kirby's still going to recruit really well. Um, And then, you know, I'm of the mind, and and this is a great – you know, segue to Will is I'm of the mind that even if it doesn't help next year, Todd Munkin and making some changes to that offensive system is going to reap dividends for Kirby Smart. Look, the last five of the last six national champions were in the top 10 in the country in points per game. Um, You have to be able to score to win the national title. Now last year, Georgia was in the bottom half of the power five, despite uh, having that elite defense that that has to get fixed or, or Kirby's not going to get the, the 1980 golden ring. You want so bad. Well, and I, I think we, you know, those of us who look at statistics sort of try not to pay too much attention to the narrative, but when it comes to this game, I think the narrative really matters. I mean, if Florida is able to, is able to take Georgia down, is able to go to the SEC championship game, is able to potentially even win the SEC championship, then, you know, what questions come out of Athens? I mean, you know, people start to, you know, you mentioned the fact that Harbaugh came really, really close year one and then has sort of regressed from there. Well, then that Harbaugh analogy actually works pretty closely with Kirby Smart. Came really, really close in year two, right, against uh, against Alabama and then has sort of drifted back further and further. Last year got absolutely blasted by LSU. And if Florida now all of a sudden comes on the scene and is playing really, really well, then you start to question, okay, is Kirby, even though he's bringing in all this talent, is he the right guy? And conversely, I mean, you look, the, the big criticism for Mullen when he was at Mississippi State was his record against Alabama, LSU, and Auburn. So he's 5-22. and 22. Um, and, and then, but but an 0-9 against Alabama. And right now he's 0-2 against Georgia, which is really the only team that they've played that's consistently had more talent than them. Um, and, and so, you know, the reality is, is that the Urban Meyer era was marked by going – you know, he went 16 and two against Florida state, Georgia and Tennessee while he was there. And, you know, Georgia is one of those ones where, you know, all those rivalry games were things that had a special area of emphasis. So Mullen's certainly familiar with the fact that those are important games to the fan base and especially Georgia, especially because they're recruiting so well, especially because, you know, those Tennessee and Florida state rivalries are kind of down. This is the one everyone's pointing to. So the narrative, if Mullen can't get over the hump in year three is going to be, okay, well, if we couldn't get over the hump in this year, what about the subsequent years? And I think then that comes down to one of the things you need to look at is schedule. And in 2021, Florida gets Alabama. 
And then they also have FAU and USF and then FSU on the schedule as non-conference. In 2022, that's when things really start to get harder with, with Utah, USF, FSU, and Texas A&M on the road. And A&M is starting to build something there under, under Jimbo Fisher. So, you know, I, I think that there's – there's an opportunity here both with the spring game missing, with all the changes Georgia, LSU, and Alabama are having to go under, and then also the fact that Florida's going to have a tougher schedule in 2021 and 2022, where this was always sort of going to be the mix where 2020 was the year that you looked at and said, geez, it would really be good if they can get it done here. But now with the missing of spring practice, I think it just sort of accentuates that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to make any uh, – I don't, I don't need to make any – Will Wade culture type allegations about Kirby Smart, but what I'll say about the the momentum piece that Will touches on, I think, is really important. And the other the other aspect of that is recruiting, right? Florida's recruiting has has gotten an uptick, and it's not all results on the field. I mean, you can debate that to your blue in the face. What impact the results on the field have on recruiting? Some of it is that they made a really smart overhaul of their recruiting staff, right? Some of it is that there's tangible improvements coming to facilities and players sometimes in tiebreaker situations, care about those things from kids I've talked to. Uh, but, you know, some of it is Kirby Smart's going to be aggressive on the trail. And if he is 3-0 and against Dan Mullen after this season, he's going to tell kids that are, that are making that choice that. He's going to tell them that in the Jacksonville area. He's going to tell them that in South Georgia, places where Florida has traditionally thrived recruiting when they're good, right, or as Bill King – Dave's buddy Bill King would say, when Florida's right, right? Those are living rooms you can walk in and and you sell Florida really well. You know, there's that, the old story about about Derrick Henry. And you can talk about the running back thing all you want, uh, running back, linebacker, whatever. But there's the old story about the final visit where Saban walked into the the Henry living room and, and, you know, oh, you're going to go to Florida? Well, if you go to Florida, you know, I'm going to beat your brains in every time I see you. So you can do that. Um, or you can come to us and, and we'll beat Florida. Uh, it's a it's an interesting sell, and to some kids, it matters. Yeah, I mean, looking at it, and I mean, year three was the year I pegged for Mullen, uh, needing to get the victory uh, over Georgia. Looking at it when he was hired, I was like, you know, when 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 does he need uh, to beat Georgia? When is the best chance to beat Georgia? And and I pegged year three as that just because you know simply because it would be the first chance Georgia would have a, a switch at quarterback. All right, Jake Fromm would be gone, uh, and and you know he left after his junior year. There would be a lot of question whether he whether he would leave after his junior year or stay for his senior year. Now he didn't have the final season uh, at Georgia. Many expected him to have, you know, but this is but his first two seasons were were some great football and, and putting Georgia in position uh, for the college football playoff. So you know now could could Florida under Mullen have beaten Georgia in in, in year one or year two? Sure, uh, we, we saw those games in the way they played out. Could they could they have won? Yes. Uh, but it wasn't likely. Uh, you know, the last two seasons, the week of the, the Florida Georgia game, I got caught up in, in picking Florida to win. But two years in a row, <laughs> going into the before the season, no way Florida can win that game. Week of the game, absolutely, Florida, Florida's going to win. And that, that's the, the fan of me probably coming out a little bit there too. But <laughs> but the, you know, there were some good reasons to, to pick Florida. You know, last year very understandable with the with the way both teams were coming into that game. Georgia struggling on offense, coming off of a South Carolina loss uh, there uh, early, you know, a couple games before that. Florida's only loss was a shootout to LSU. Uh, but, you know, it, Georgia rallied during the bye week, uh, came up with a solid game plan, had some, you know, help, help early by some wrong wristbands and, and, and protected Jake from uh, for the uh, for, and he you know, carves up Florida's defense third down all game long. Uh, you know, maybe 2018, Mullen's first year would you maybe got ahead of ourselves uh, a little bit. You know, Florida wasn't ready to go toe to toe with Georgia uh, that year. Uh, but Will and I have kind of had this uh, debate behind the scenes a little bit. And to me, in totality, the teams weren't that far apart in, in 2019. Uh, the game somewhat competitive. But Georgia was in control mostly. That, that, if you look solely at that game, you would say there was a, a gap. But as I mentioned, Georgia lost to South Carolina. Fluke, not a fluke. Well, either way, they lost that game. You look at similar opponents. I think they both played Auburn, Auburn very similarly. Uh, Tennessee, kind of similar type games as well. You, you look at the final polls and, and when the way the season played out there, uh, they were really, really close. So I, I think you look at the game itself in 2019, you could say, yeah, there's a gap. We kind of knew that gap was there. But when you look at common opponents, where the way the season played out, 
weren't that far apart. And with all the questions surrounding Georgia, you know, you can't blame people for. Uh, I see a lot of people saying, "Oh, how can you pick Florida till they prove it?" Well, if that's the case, then you know you would never pick any other team in, in, in all these streaks at all uh, in college football. But you had to go out there on a whim sometimes and, and pick it. You can see why people were picking Florida. It's not an out of you know stratosphere thought that Florida can beat Georgia. Yeah, I mean the reason that you the reason you pick Florida is the reason that I think is, is the reason that Georgia is a little bit nervous right now. Which is you know Neil, you mentioned Jim Harbaugh, but the other guy maybe to bring up is Butch Jones. I mean Butch Jones was somebody who would go out on the field and Tennessee would find a way to just snatch defeat from the jaws of victory repeatedly. And and Smart has shown a proclivity to do that. I mean the Alabama games jump out, you know the second and twenty six and the fake punt. But the year before there were a couple of examples where you know the hail mary against Tennessee is is one. Of the things that jumps out, but there have been, and and even in the games against Florida, I, I think Georgia has been a much better team the last two years. But they have left points on the field, particularly two years ago. There were a bunch of field goals that Kirby Smart was taking real deep in Florida territory that sort of let the Gators stay in the game or at least have some hope that you know a guy like Mullen I don't think would have done. He would have just said, you know what, if you can stop me on fourth and goal from the one, you're going to stop me at fourth and goal from the one. So he he has not maximized his talent when he's been out on the field. And, you know, the other thing is Ohio State made the playoff last year. If they make the playoff again, that'll be two straight years in the playoff with the guy that Kirby Smart had picked as the replacement for Jake Fromm. And if Newman struggles at all, <laughs> you know, I know what it would be like to be a fan in Gainesville if that situation occurred. You know, we, and we we got a little bit of a taste of it with Cam Newton, but certainly because we were coming off of Tim Tebow, I think that it was a little bit a little bit less pronounced in Gainesville. But can you imagine if if Tebow hadn't been able to get Florida over the hump, and then Newton had transferred to Auburn, and then all of a sudden Auburn wins the national championship? I mean, that's really what you're talking about with with Ohio State and Justin Fields and. And so, again, I, th- I think the the noise is going to increase in Georgia considerably if Smart takes another step back this year from where they were last year and a loss to Florida is another step back for Georgia. Yeah, Neil, think, Neil before, yeah, before you oh, jump in, yeah, and I did have a point, too, about uh, about Kirby and, and all this. Now, I, I kind of do want to get rid of the label that he can't coach. Now, does he have, has he had some boneheaded mistakes? Absolutely. Could you mark that up to early in his coaching tenure – Maybe uh, he's gonna. There was gonna be some learning on the job things, but uh, you won't hear me say that he can't coach. Uh, there's too many wins out there that he's had. Getting to Atlanta, beating Florida when uh, you know everything's on the table, finding ways to win games last year, even though it was uh, ugly. You know, you could say you know two out of the last three years they, they've met up. Kirby's out talented Mullen, uh, but you know last year. Georgia outcoached and out talented Florida. They, they, they outcoached Florida last year. And a lot of people don't want to hear it, don't want to admit it, but they they admit they outcoached Florida last year. Uh, so you know, you know, if I'm building a team from scratch and talent is even, you know, Mullen's my guy, and no doubt about it. You know, 2020 game to me, this coming up year, we're, we're talking about it. It will come down to coaching. This 2020 season, both both coaches, I think it, it will come down to coaching just because of what Georgia's facing what we said they faced throughout spring uh, and, and having to, yes, they have a talent advantage, but there's a, just a, a whole lot of questions there. So coaching is going to be so important uh, in, in 2020. So, you know, there's finally the thought nationally, you know, going into a season that, that Florida can beat Georgia. So with so much newness at Georgia, you know, coaching will be the biggest factor in, in all this, you know, negating a talent gap somewhat. Does Georgia have more baseline talent? Absolutely. But, you know, but this is Mullen's chance to take advantage of being such a great coach or such a great developer. And if it doesn't happen, then it's time you know, for, for Gator fans to give Smart probably a little more credit uh, for being a pretty darn good coach in his own right. I already think he's won. He's knocking on that doorstep of elite. But uh, he, he may keep himself from, <laughs> from being labeled elite. But I, the notion that he can't coach or can't develop, I think, is a little overblown. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, what's he been to Atlanta every year uh, other than his first year? About size his first year, yeah. It's pretty good. Um, now, you know, I think – And that should be a feather in cap. That should be a feather in cap, though. You know, it, be, it, be, be, beating him no, – and also beating him, it should be a feather in your cap. I think it is. And, you know, and, uh, and the South Carolina game is another one that Will didn't mention where they just made mystifying coaching decisions that, mm. um, that, <laughs> that really cost them the – the football game um, with, without any real question in my mind. But, but at the same time, uh, you know, it's interesting. There's a piece I'm working on for the summer 
for Saturday down south or was working off in the summer. We'll see when it gets run now. <laughs> but, uh, but you know, one guy that was interesting to talk to was, was, was Jim Donnan. And uh, Jim Donnan said the thing about the Florida-Georgia game, and Jim Donnan, the only Georgia coach to win a Florida-Georgia game in the 90s, um, the only Georgia coach to beat Steve Spurrier. And he said the thing about the Florida-Georgia game was Steve Spurrier understood the Florida-Georgia game. Um, Kirby Spark understands the Florida game. His best coaching jobs have come in Jacksonville. Uh, year one, an outstanding coaching job, a team that was overmatched, um, especially with what they had offensively versus what Florida had defensively. Uh, but they stayed in the game, hung around for four quarters. Last year, thoroughly outcoached Florida on both sides of the football, I thought. And, you know, in particular, their offensive game plan for – what Todd Grantham did, which remains somewhat mind boggling. Um, you know, it, it kind of goes without saying. So I think that's a piece that, that makes it a really important game for Mullen is prove that, you know, you're not just going to let Kirby win this game that matters so much to him. Cause it does matter a lot to Kirby. Like it mattered a lot to Steve Spurrier. Um, and, you know, so that's, I think that's a big thing that, about the game that doesn't get discussed, but to Will's point, uh, there is a flip side and I'm glad Will brought it up to, to kind of my Harbaugh argument and, and Will made the points, you know, really well, but I also think it's a recruiting bonus for Mullen, of course, if he wins, right. Cause then he can say, Hey, you know, my talent is finally close to his talent and, and look, who won the football game. Come be a part of something. So, um, you know, it, it's interesting, like rivalry game results on the field seem to matter more in recruiting. And there's empirical evidence of this with Florida and Florida state. Mm-hmm. And, than other results on the field type arguments. And I think when you're in heated battles with a border war divisional rival, which to me is what makes Georgia Florida's arch rival and not FSU, uh, you know, I think it's just such a huge deal. And so, you know, it's not just coronavirus that has us talking about this game. Like, yeah, we'd be talking about the spring game, <laughs> but you know, you know what we'd be talking about at the day after the spring game until October is for going to be Georgia. Well, and, and Dave, I, I, I agree with you in some respects about Smart. I do think that, I mean, he's obviously an elite recruiter. And I do believe his game plans have been pretty solid coming into the games that I've watched fully against Florida. And when Florida hasn't been able to adjust or hasn't had the talent to adjust, then George has been able to pull out that game. But it takes a lot of effort to out must champ, must champ, buddy. <laughs> like he, so I'm glad Neil brought that up because that was my rebuttal that was coming when, uh, when you brought that up is, you know, the the – the ability to make in-game adjustments, the ability to make the right call to maximize your talent, to go for it on fourth down when you know you don't have as talented a team, or to go for it on fourth down when you're leaving points on the field. Like All statistical evidence says that fourth and goal from the one, you should always go for it. And two years ago, he did it twice where he kicked field goals. That's the only reason Florida had any hope. Even if he'd just gotten one touchdown out of the two times he was down there, it would have put Florida away and it wouldn't have even been close. And so those are the types of things that happen. It's one of the reasons that, that they were, that South Carolina was in that game. I mean, they had their third string quarterback in there who they really didn't trust to throw the ball and somehow were still able to move the ball into field goal position every once in a while. So, um, you know, but yeah, you know, the other thing I think that we that that where the jury's sort of out is is the switch that Georgia made, or not the switch, but the um, the change that they made because they lost all those wide receivers from 2018 and really weren't able to right the ship on offense in 2019. And Mullen has an opportunity to show something there too. I mean, you know, Neil, you you'd mentioned I, I think in your article and then and then before we came on that the wide receivers Florida's going to have to replace. If Mullen's really able to show he can do that, I think that's a real feather in his cap as well. Yeah, I mean it's it's going to be hard. I, I, you know, I've seen a lot of of the Florida fan base that you know people that I think know a lot about football that that you know I follow or, or notice their tweets or comments on articles I write or comments on other articles. And, oh, it's going to be okay. Jacob Copeland's supposed to break out, or you know, Florida's really recruited well at the position, or, or the Gators have hit the transfer portal really well, and they've got an All American tight end coming back. And the bottom line is you have four players that did everything to impact winning that you can ask them to do. So you've got a leadership piece, you've got a special teams piece and a couple different guys. You've got the two best route runners in the program are gone. Uh, and then you have probably the best vertical threat. So everybody, 
you know, can Kadarius Tony finally do what the playbook says to quote Dan Mullen? Um, you know, probably not. I mean, let's be honest. I don't think he's going to change too much. Maybe he can be a little bit better. Maybe they can get him in on some of those shallow crosses. Plenty of time to talk to X and O's, but he's got to be more productive and more consistent. Uh, can Jacob Copeland be more consistent? It's, those are huge shoes to fill, particularly to me, Van Jefferson and Freddie Swain. I don't want to diminish Tyree Cleveland or Joshua Hammond at all, but I think there's kind of a tier A and a tier B of those four. But it's going to be very, very difficult for Florida. And I'll, I'll point this out. Georgia last year, because Will kind of mentioned it, Georgia lost their five top players in terms of passing game production. And some of Jake Fromm's problems were that. Uh, not all of them but certainly some of them. Their sixth best passing game production person was DeAndre Swift. Okay, Florida, including LaMichael Pirine, next year loses four of seven. So the return of Trayvon Grimes was immense, right? Because otherwise, Florida would be in that five of seven position just like Georgia. Florida's a little less bad off than the dogs were. Um, but, but yeah, it's going to be an immense challenge for Dan Mullen. And it's another reason that, you know, if there's anything I'm – you know, I think Florida fans have to regret about spring ball, Will and, and Dave. It's that those guys don't get their run out, and you don't get to see the offensive line come together and say, hey, there's going to be more balance, which reduces that that pressure on those receivers to, to be better. Yeah, I'd say the biggest difference there, you know, in comparing maybe to what Georgia did last year is while you do lose so many targets, there's the, the depth behind them still produced to a bit, uh, to a point. Uh, so a little more experience, uh, and, uh, maybe Kyle Pitts being, being the returning, uh, leading receiver helps in that respect too, where it's not, it's not a complete fall off. There's still some proven production, uh, there that comes back, but you know, they absolutely helped glue together, you know, Kyle Trask coming in and, and having a rapport with those guys. Uh, from you know right away uh, from him coming into the Kentucky game and and, and moving forward uh, we, we saw how comfortable he was with those uh, with that talented depth as well so yeah uh, those you know offensive line wide receiver definitely uh, the biggest question that we'll miss uh, from the Gators this spring so uh, Will anything else before we uh, get into some of the the, the poll and the tweets no nah, man, just just when <laughs> I'm, I'm tired of coming on here at the week after a loss and being all depressed. Give, give, me, give me a win where we can start gloating to our Georgia friends and uh, and and give it back to them a little bit. Well, that's part of it. Uh, a lot of the Gator fan base here. Uh, so I did put out a poll today. Uh, you know, I said definitely it, it's not for job jeopardy uh, for Dan Mullen. Dan, yeah. you know, uh, 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 Neil, you put that in your piece as well. You know, this is no referendum on Dan Mullen's job uh, moving forward uh, in 2020 for the Florida Georgia game. But you know, it, it's in however pretty much you want to define it. You know, um, define it. Is Georgia must win for Florida this coming season? Uh, in what way? And that's how we got uh, a lot of responses here. But yes, 88 percent of, of our my Twitter followers out there, out of uh, 1,350 votes, 88 percent say it is a must win uh, for Dan Mullen uh, this coming season. So start with TK at tailgater and Neil, kind of something you spoke on here. Got to start beating them on the field to start winning on the recruiting trail consistently. Get back to the Gator standard Spurrier established and urban embraced beat your rivals. And I mean, Neil, I'm glad you said it with the way Kirby approaches this game. It, it is so similar to how Steve Spurrier uh, approached the game. And look, both guys played for their schools. Uh, Spurrier played for Florida, and he knew the importance of that game all the way back to the 60s. Kirby Smart played in that game in the 90s. Both of those guys got their brains beat in by the other side when they played. So disappointing losses. They take this game personally, and it shows it, and it showed with Spurrier, and it shows with, with Smart their preparation going into the game. Yeah, I mean, Kirby even – you know, he doesn't have the humor, of course, but he, <laughs> he even sounds a little bit like Steve when he's pressed about the game. Um, you know, and he took he, – he, we all saw the zinger he fired, I think it was college football playoff week, semifinal week when he came on uh, game day and, and they asked about coaches he respected. And, you know, and he said that Orgeron sits next to him at media days because – or for some reason. And – uh he, he respects the, the guy at LSU a little more than, than another coach. And like, you know, it was like, Whoa, 
Uh, so, so there was like some spurrier pot shots, but you know, last year, remember there was the big debate about whether they should go home and home. And people thought Kirby really wanted to go home and home cause he does. And, uh, but somebody said, Oh, do you want to go home and home? And he was like, why would I want to go to the swamp? I got, I got my brains beat in there, you know? And like, to me, it was just kind of like he was deflecting, but you could also see that 25 years later, he was still really mad about getting the crap beat out of him. Right. And so it's personal. All right, Brian Hicks uh, says uh, ten and two is amazing, uh, but it's about championships. Look at SEC history since the split, and it's us and Bama. But we've lost respect over the last decade. Have to get that back. Uh, thus, a must win. But also, don't go one and eleven with a Georgia win. So <laughs> that's uh, but anyway. If you have to, if for whatever reason you do go one and eleven, it better be the Georgia game. So <laughs> being the only win there. Uh, Maverick uh, says a must win. The recruiting narrative has to change. If Kirby wins, then the perception is uh, is that he owns Florida. Combine that with sketchy recruiting tactics, and kids will keep choosing Georgia over Florida. In order to counter the current trend, Mullen has to show kids that he is better uh, than Kirby. Um, Will, here's another one, and you and I hit this so much under the Jim McElwain era. We haven't necessarily had time to show it for the Dan Mullen era, but it may, we may can start bringing this word around. Uh, Robert Kraft says, for the program to show progression, they must beat Georgia. Yeah, I mean that's the next step, right? And with with the schedule, with the schedule in 2020, and sort of the the way things sit in front of them, that that is progress. I think you know year one, everybody looked at, especially after the Kentucky loss. I think everybody was excited with where Florida wound up. I think last year they ended up exactly where most people predicted them to be at the beginning of the season, to be second in the East, and have a really successful season and and lose to the teams that they lost to. I think that's a a, it was a reasonable thing that happened and something that most people predicted. Most people had them 10 and 3, 11 and 2 last year. Um, this year, there's going to be people picking them to win the SEC East. There's going to be people picking them to win the SEC. There's going to be people picking them to go to the playoffs. So the expectations are there. And and if they end up going 11 and 2, lose to Georgia and LSU and go to the Orange Bowl again or go to, you know, whatever whatever group of six uh, or, power, you know, New Year's Six bowl game again that'll be considered a disappointment this year because of what the expectations are and i think that's just sort of the reality and and mullen hasn't shied away from expectations since he's come to gainesville so he certainly understands that Neil, i'll get your thought on the next one one more in progression here dustin Wilbright, he is kind of agrees there he goes now we're at the point uh you know where is if um, if we keep seeing year to year pro- now we're we're now at the point where it is if we keep seeing year to year progression then beating georgia is the next step if we don't beat them, we didn't progress for the year. Uh, so kind of, you know, that's following that thought there. But uh, Allie Peak Wilbur, Eric Wilbur's uh, wife, or you guys out there that don't know, former, former Florida Gators punter, she says, a thousand percent, I don't think Mullen gets fired if he doesn't win, uh, but all hope is lost that he will ever be better uh, than a Mark Rick. The schedule is primed for Florida to make a deep run. This is the year, and it starts with Georgia. So you start seeing that narrative out there, and of course, because of the connection, the Florida Georgia game, Mark Rick being there, and so many preseason expectations, so many one-two lost seasons, so many times going into the Florida game only to end up, uh, you know, falling on their face uh, there in Jacksonville. Um, you know, a lot of people just because of the, the first two games and the way Georgia's recruiting are already starting the Dan Mullen Mark Rick comparison. Yeah, uh, it's kind of unfair uh, to, to get it going this early, I think. But, you know, that's the nature of, of it. It's something I touched on in my piece. Expectations are a little different in Gainesville. I mean, you know, Steve Spurrier, people are mad at Steve Spurrier for losing that Tennessee game. If you were in, around Gainesville, you know, after that game, uh, I was as a very – as a baby student um, – you know, it was like, you know, you thought the world had ended. And, and it was like, at the end of the day, they were, they were nine and two and really, really good. Right. Um, so that's, that's the nature of the beast. There was a Plaza of the Americas petition my last year uh, as an undergrad to, to remove Billy Donovan as head coach. They had just uh, gotten eliminated from the, the first round of the NCAA tournament for the fifth straight season, first weekend. Right. Uh, what happened after that, right? They, they won the SEC and then they won two national titles after that. So um, 
you know, expectations are just different. Even legends, not even legendary coaches are immune and, and that'll, that'll happen. I don't know about Mark Richt, but, but one comparison that sticks with me is John Cooper at Ohio state who put together a ton of teams that won 10 games, but was like, uh, you know, I don't know the exact record, but I think he, he beat Michigan like twice. Uh, <laughs> right. Like just got worked by Lloyd Carr pretty consistently. And, and uh, it prevented Ohio State from winning championships. And so, uh, you know, that's – Steve Spurrier said the path to Atlanta goes through Jacksonville, um, which is one of his ridiculous comments because anyone who has a map knows that's not true. But <laughs> <laughs> it's true, though. It's true in college football. Well, especially for, especially for Florida, Will, before you jump in, you know, Florida's never made it to Atlanta losing to Georgia. It just, it just hasn't happened, you know. It just – you know, Florida and Tennessee, that that, that game, uh, the loser of that game has went, went on to Atlanta uh, when that was a rivalry in the 90s. But between Florida and Georgia, for whatever reason, the you know, loser of that game has not represented, or uh, well, for Florida side anyway, has not. And Florida hasn't represented the East when they've lost to Georgia. Yeah, well, and the other thing I think maybe to consider here is, you know, Neil, you mentioned recruiting earlier, but – one of the things that always gets thrown in our faces when we when we suggest that the recruiting isn't good enough or that it needs to pick up, you know, that Mullen is improving, but it's certainly not at the level of a Clemson or a, or a Alabama or an LSU right now or a Georgia, is that, you know, well, Clemson was able to build their program on top of, you know, top 10 recruiting classes, even top 15 recruiting classes, but not the elite of the elite of the elite. But you know what? Year three under Dabo Swinney, they won the conference. Year four under Dabo Swinney, they won the conference, and they took advantage of the fact that the ACC was was down, and particularly in Dabo's third year, they went 10-4. and four. That was a year they got absolutely boat raced by West Virginia in the Orange Bowl, but at the same time, they were able to win the conference and be the, be the, um, the beacon for that particular conference and, and able to build from there. And so I do think if people are going to look at Clemson and say, well, maybe Florida has a chance to be this outlier because we're looking at that team, then you got to start hitting some of those benchmarks that Clemson was hitting along the way too. And so winning this game against Georgia because it puts you in the SEC championship game most likely is, is part of getting to that point. And, you know, if you're not going to hit the, if you're not going to hit the recruiting goals that have traditionally been necessary to win the SEC, then you're going to have to start hitting some of those on-field on field goals that, that Clemson hit along the way if you want me to buy into the idea that, that again, it, you know, it, we're, we're not talking about, um, you know, Florida becoming Kentucky. What we're talking about is the difference between being a championship team and being a team that just is on the cusp but can't quite get over the, can't quite get over the goal line. And, and this, year's, this year's game is going to tell us a lot about that. Yeah. Okay. Going to the other side of the argument here, John Rosado at Utah Gator says Georgia is not a must win game. It is a game that's most likely need to win the East consistently having 10 plus win seasons is what is, is what's a must for Florida and Dan Mullen. The must win game for the season is LSU. Although I will not say if uh, and will or Neil, you put this uh, in here too. Although I will say if not now, then when, uh, of course that a lot of fans are, are asking themselves that, uh, Alec um, Dalziel, I hope I'm saying that right. He goes, um, says, I don't see how it is. Yes, it shows Florida is not on par with Georgia, but we aren't. They they out recruit, we out coach. I want it more than anything, but I'd rather lose to a strong Georgia team than Tennessee or Kentucky. If there's a loss in the East, you don't want it to be them. My only thing is, it, kind of combining those two, we can ask the question: If not 2020, then when? Uh, because you know, as we said, Georgia's recruiting is not slowing down. Uh, Florida, you know, will still be kind of figuring out quarterback after you know Kyle Trask uh, this year, or if they're switching between Kyle Trask and Emory Jones somewhat in 2020. You know, the year after that would be Emory Jones or Anthony Richardson's first full time season. So you'd have a you know quarterback change for Florida either way in 2021. Uh, so you know things were kind of picking out about Georgia and, and, and switching quarterbacks, going, leaving, going from Jake Fromm to another quarterback, or going to be questions we're having about Florida in 2021 there. So, um, but there are some arguments to the other side of, uh, of it not being a must win in 2020. I just think uh, a lot of reasons we point to it being a must win in 2020 is because we don't see the Georgia recruiting machine slowing down anytime soon. Yeah, right. It's closer to a must win than not a must win. Yeah, there you go. That's probably the best way to put it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. I mean, they're not going to, George is not going to stop recruiting and that he's going to keep signing top five classes. 
I mean, and and Will's right that like if that doesn't translate to a national championship, then you know there's going to be questions that are asked. But he's also an alum who's gotten him three downs from a national title, so his job security is going to be pretty good. Um, it'll just be kind of come a a, nor, a more of a journalist question as to whether he'll get over the hump until he either does or you know there is a problem. Um, but yeah, I mean, Florida's. I don't know if Dan Mullen is ever going to out recruit Kirby Smart at Florida. Yeah, I don't think that's a hot take, right? I think it's just you know Mullen has done really good things to overhaul his staff, and and Florida's recruiting operation has improved, and I think will continue to improve. But you know maybe they'll sign the number three class one year, and Georgia will be fourth. Right? <laughs> maybe something like that. Uh... Uh, one more uh, tweet here I wanted to get in here. Just uh, a good point brought up uh, here. He goes, uh, Gator CPA, uh, at Tom Gator CPA, says, I remember how this series was in the 70s and 80s with Georgia owning us. Charlie Pell's teams were always tight heading into the game. Lose this year, and the feeling will be that we're reverting to those days. Can't have fans and players feeling the, the Georgia game is a lost cause. That one hits home for me because every bit of that is true. And I grew up in Georgia in the 90s. And in the 2000s, and all my best friends are Georgia fans. Uh, you know, I, I know so many Georgia fans. I was I was raised around them. They felt the same way in the 90s and the 2000s. That are you know even there were there were years. And there weren't many years in the 90s. You know you probably maybe could pick out one or two where Georgia maybe could be considered the better team. Showed up tight, you know, and got their brains beat in by Spurrier. Uh, the 2008. Uh, squad going in, you know, preseason number one Georgia team and Florida blast them and goes on to win the national championship. And then you know, that was a final straw for a lot of them, <laughs> a lot of my Georgia fans too, for that 2008 year uh, because you know, of them being preseason number one. And Florida ends up winning a national championship game and that game not even being close. But there was that thought of going to Jacksonville. Why, why even play that game? Because we're going to go and get beat. No matter how, we, how good we are, you, go, you look at 2002, Ron Zook's first year. Florida had no business winning that game. Georgia's only loss of the season. It just kind of seemed like uh, some kind of curse. But uh, I, I can, I, I guess, you know, that Gator fans thought there of saying, "Will, you know, this is maybe the year to get it done." And you know, the way the game started out last year and the crazy wristband scenario and all that stuff, you know, maybe there's just some kind of hex uh, uh, going on. It, but, 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 but football's more serious than that. Don't get me wrong. But uh, that's how a lot of fans feel. There's a bad, bad juju. But, you know, I mean, I think I think that's part of why there's so much bad blood in this rivalry, right, is that you never necessarily know what's going to happen. And, and teams that don't necessarily have the most talent show up and, and put a, you know, put a beat down on the other team in a completely unexpected way. And the one I'm thinking about is the game a few years ago where Treon Harris was the starting quarterback and they threw the ball like four times. I mean, that was one where, he, I mean, again, you, you sort of walk out of there going, wow, we just got our butts kicked. Not, I mean, if you're a Georgia fan for that one. And, and you know, over the last three or four years, Florida has experienced that where, where you know, the last year under McElwain and, the, and then the first year under Mullen and last year a little bit less so, but, but still you're starting to experience that. I mean, it, the reality is, is that I think, I think this is likely a must win for, for Mullen in terms of not his long-term survival at Florida, but his ability to compete. And, and the recruiting argument has always been that Auburn gets Alabama every once in a while, but Alabama is the team that's going to the national championship and winning two straight and winning, you know, four out of seven or whatever it is under Saban. And Auburn is able to sneak in there every once in a while. And based on the way um, these teams are currently constructed and, and the level of recruiting that's going on, that's what you would expect. And then the question is, is Mullen able to close that gap to a place where it's more 50-50 or where Florida even has an advantage? And with all the advantages that Florida has, particularly with the with the spring practice situation and the coronavirus, this is an opportunity for Mullen to really shine. And so if Florida isn't able to get over the hump here, I think it's an indication that you're more like Auburn to Alabama than it is you know, a 50-50 mix. Neil, you said in the chat, I had to preach because you're from Atlanta. I mean – you, and you know, I, I've seen you, you. You've wrote about Florida, Georgia, the game itself, plenty of times. There was that feeling uh, of Georgia just being too tight in, in the game. Yeah, no, no doubt. Um, I mean, I think, I think uh, for me, and hopefully that doesn't bleed over into you know the fans thinking the same thing. 
for, yeah, for, for well, the Florida side. And and more into the locker room. I mean, one story yeah. I wrote, you know, one story I wrote last year for two years ago now for Saturday Down South was about, you know, about Florida Georgia and some of the big upsets and and got to talk to Rex Grossman and Rex um, called it a helmet game when he was there. He said, oh, it was a helmet game. And I said, what's that mean? And he said, oh, it means that when we came out onto the field, they looked at our helmets and freaked out. Um, and, and that's the only way that he could explain what happened in 2002 was that, you know, he said, coach Zook put together a really good defensive game plan, kind of took away what they did well, uh, and, and made, you know, their quarterbacks make tight throws. Um, and then, you know, Florida just tried to get the ball to playmakers in space because Spurrier had left behind these playmakers and, and they knew that Rex was playing with a sprained knee and, and Florida ends up winning the Grossman big drive and the throw to your buddy Ben Troop there at the end. But but for, for Georgia to lose that game was unthinkable. I mean, that team, that Georgia team beat everybody by double digits except for Tennessee. Uh, they just shouldn't have ever lost to that Florida team, and they did. And so, you know, that's an important aspect to it too. I mean, there's like, a, like we said tonight, there's so many things that go into this year's game, I think. Um, and just for Florida to go in with kind of a roster, with, with the roster being as equal as ever, a schemat- schematic continuity, and then all the things that are related to, to coronavirus. Yeah, I mean, you know, definitely very close to a must win. As Will said, in order to see, is Dan Mullen going to consistently compete for national championships? Before we move on, Will, um, we uh, got a little bit of a breaking news here I have to put in the, in the YouTube chat. Bill Sykes has joined the YouTube oh. chat. So... <laughs> Bill, <laughs> thanks for uh, thanks for listening in, Bill. I actually, I actually talked to him today. So uh, he's 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 gonna start some crap in the chat. I'm gonna enjoy it. <laughs> Bill's like, who's this guy with Will and Dave? <laughs> <laughs> I, love, I love it. Uh, he's about to get into a Jamie Newman debate. It looks like so. Uh, I'll, I'll, oh, yeah. I'll, um, but he even he even admits he hasn't watched too close. So. Sergeant AR10 said, "Good luck in the Orange Bowl, Gators." In the comments. And yeah. I think every Florida fan would be really excited if Florida was in the Orange Bowl because that's the college football playoff. <laughs> <laughs> so, nice job, Sergeant AR-10. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> All right, before we sign off here, Will, let's go to your piece, uh, reading reaction uh, here and comparing a little bit of Kyle Trask and uh, and Kellen Mond. Of course, uh, I mentioned earlier SEC Network's um, – you know, it was. <laughs> I kind of. It really caught me off guard uh, there, uh, with, with Jordan Rogers and the the love affair, I guess, of, of Kellamon and considering him um, maybe the SEC's best quarterback heading in uh, to twenty twenty. Uh, I mean, I don't know. Uh, I, I I don't see it. I think. I, I think you got to start. I think you got to start with Trask as far as what he proved in the SEC. Maybe other people out there are trying to talk themselves out of it. Uh, maybe I guess because it it can't be that simple. But with you know losing Jake Fromm, losing Burrow, losing Tua, and what the, the production there that was from Kyle Trask last year, I guess they a lot of people out there just want don't want to go out by default. They, they they feel like Kyle Trask is the default pick there, and they're trying to talk themselves out of it. That's I think they're making it a little bit harder on themselves, Will. Yeah, well, you even saw this last year, where I think after Tua and Burrow, people were sort of and and from that that was sort of the first tier of quarterbacks, and yeah. people didn't have Burrow in that first tier last year during the off season, except for, except for me. But but the idea that, <laughs> but the idea that that there was a first tier and then there was a second tier, and, and we didn't know how that second tier was going to shake out with Burrow and Trask and and Mond and and those sorts like, of guys. And Frank. I think, Franks. Franks. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <I didn't. laughs> but but if you look at it, I, th- I think there was a case to be made that Mon could be the guy who sort of stepped to the top of that of that second tier. And then he didn't. He actually regressed. So he only averaged 6.9 yards per attempt. And so I went and I looked at some of the underlying statistics to try to understand, okay, where did he struggle? Why did he struggle? Is that going to get better? And, and is there reason to believe it's going to get better? And how did he compare to Trask? And 
And it's interesting because when you look at the film on Mond, he looks really impressive. He's a guy who's able to use his feet to generate extra time. He's also able to run. There was a game, I think it was against Arkansas, where he ran for like 125 yards and, and really sort of put the game away with his feet. But when you look at it, whenever he was under pressure, so um, you know, one of the stats I had in there was when he's under pressure, he completed 41% of his passes. When he was not under pressure, he completed 70% of his passes. So he, he had a 30% difference in completion percentage when he was under pressure versus when he wasn't versus Trask, who was at 67 under pressure and at 67 without pressure and in fact even averaged more yards per attempt when he was under pressure so blitzing trash didn't necessarily do you a whole lot of good but against mond it was something you could do consistently and then when you looked on second and 10 or second and 10 plus mond had a 74 percent completion percentage third and 10 plus it dropped down to 37 and a half and trash actually went up he was at 67 percent on second and 10 plus and then third and 10 plus he was at 79 percent completion percentage so i just think there are a lot of things that indicate that there are things you can do with your scheme to get pressure on kellen mon that really disrupt what he wants to do and when you look at the overall statistical package it, it just wasn't very impressive last year and the reason it wasn't impressive is because he's got real holes in his game and i'm not sure that those holes are things that jimbo fisher is going to be able to fix i mean you know I, we've talked a lot about you know, with the stuff that I've written with completion percentage translating from high school to high school to college and Mond was sitting at 55% completion percentage in high school. And he's been right around there when you factor in his three years, when he's been at, uh, when he's been at Texas A&M. So does he have another jump in his ability to complete passes? I mean, he was at 61% last year, but he dropped off in his yards per attempt. So you really sort of figure that that increase came from being a little bit more conservative in their game plan. And, you know, Jordan Rogers point in, in his discussion with 24 seven was that they had weapons coming in at tight end guys who were true freshmen last year, one who played and one who redshirted who were going to be weapons for Mond. But again, you got to wonder, is he going to be able to take advantage of those weapons based on the limitations that he's shown thus far? So, you know, it's still possible that he could be the best quarterback in the sec. I suppose. I, I just don't think that there's a real statistical case for it. And if I were going to pick, I mean, guys who've had better statistical seasons over the past couple of years who are going to be starters in the SEC last year, Terry Wilson at Kentucky and even Jarek Warantano at Tennessee. I think those guys have better statistical cases to be the best, uh, the best returning quarterback in the SEC. I don't think those are guys who are probably going to do it, but if you were just going to look at statistics and even, even sort of the eye test when it comes to Wilson, you, you might pick them over Mond. Um, Guarantano obviously had a little bit of a cupcake schedule on the back end of Tennessee last year where he padded his stats, but, but still, I mean, you know, there really wasn't a difference in Mond when he was playing good teams and when he was playing bad teams. So, um, yeah, I, I'm not sure where that attitude comes from. I think it comes mainly from people expected him to take a step forward under Jimbo last year from 2008 to 2018 to 2019. And so there's this expectation he's going to take that step forward in 2020 since he didn't take it last year. And I, I just don't know if there's evidence to suggest that. One telling stat, Will, that I have to, to steal from your article to let everybody out there know, but go, go read the rest of it. And the, but the telling stat here is, quote, you know, yards per completion totals were nearly identical with Trask at 11.3 and Mon at 11.2. Yards per completion totals, almost identical. One more time. Trask at 11.3, Mon at 11.2. But Trask, yards per attempt, it really indicates he's a much better passer sitting at 8.3 yards per attempt to Mon's 6.9. I mean, not even close uh, when you want to co compare him in that. And one more stat I just made up just because you brought him up. Um, maybe I have to start tracking this. How many times does Jeremy Pruitt pull Jarrett Garantano? <laughs> Yes, that is a determining factor in terms of how we should how we should analyze these guys. I'll tell you one thing I didn't put in the article that I think is is interesting. So a lot of the stuff that I got out of uh, a lot of the stats I used were from SEC Statcat, and one thing that they have is basically how long it takes the quarterback to get the ball out. And on third and ten plus, where I already indicated that Mon struggled, he took two point nine seconds to get the ball out. On third and ten plus for Trask, two point zero seven seconds to get the ball out. So you know the, the Trask was able to adapt to the fact that his offensive line was struggling, got the ball out fast, and got it out to the guy. You know this sort of goes back to the point that Neil was making earlier about the wide receivers and replacing those guys. That that you know the fact that Van Jefferson was always open because he ran fantastic routes. 
meant that when he was the right read and Trask got the ball his direction, he was able to complete the pass. And we saw that. I mean, I think we got a first glimpse at that against Kentucky where all of a sudden it felt like the ball was being spread around much more equally once Trask came into the game. doesn't mean he's a better quarterback than Felipe Franks. just means that he's doing things differently. And and the way he does it is is really is really through understanding where he needs to go with the football and then trusting that this guy's going to be there. So, um, yeah, there, there's there's a lot of things out there. I mean, I was looking for any stat that would indicate that Mond is is a better uh, is is a good bet to to think that he's going to excel in 2020. I, I just couldn't really find it. And Neil, I, I brought this you know, when when Will started, you know, telling me he was going to write an article comparing these two. The only thing I could come up with that may even it up just a bit is Mon and, and his legs. Now, I'll admit, he makes some clutch runs uh, late in games, but you know, it's not, his legs aren't enough of a determining factor to, to, to make him really take that next step as a quarterback. It, it helps him and mask his deficiency as a passer, but it's not like it's an added bonus to you know, have him take that next step as a quarterback. Yeah, I mean, you, could, you can scheme him, too. You can scheme it, um, to Will's point, I think. You know, one thing Todd Grantham has done very well, uh, we saw Bryce Perkins kind of do his thing because he's special uh, in the Orange Bowl um, a little bit. But but for the most part, Florida hasn't been been hurt by mobile quarterbacks that they played. Um, and, you know, I bring up Grantham because it's not unique to Florida. I mean, look at – compare the two against LSU. I mean, Florida's guys – wide receivers getting open, but, but mine was 10 of 30 for 92 yards and threw three interceptions at tiger stadium. Like that was his stat line. So like the fact that he had 50 yards rushing, you know, they had kind of schemed to keep him in the pocket and he made some plays with his legs, but nothing to keep them even remotely in the football game. And so, yeah, I mean, you can contain him, you can scheme him and, or you can blitz him. There's a lot of different ways to defense, uh, Kellen Mond, and for all the supposed weaknesses in Kyle Trask, uh, there weren't a whole lot of ways to defense him, uh, particularly effectively uh, last season. So I just don't know how you can really make a good faith argument that that he's going to be the best quarterback in the, in the SEC. And it's just like like Will said, there's not really any statistical evidence for it. In fact, uh, you know, with Raheem Boyd in Arkansas, you, you could make an argument that that Felipe Franks is the the best returning quarterback in that division. So there's a hot take. There's a hot take. <laughs> that that is a hot take. We'll we'll have to look at that one a little bit closer. But uh, no, nah, so these guys Trask. It's interesting because Trask and Mon played four common opponents last year, and the attempts were almost the same. It was 154 for Mon, 136 for Trask. Trask was more accurate, more yards, more yards per attempt. His touchdown to interception was 11 to two and Mon was four to three. Passer rating 147 to 111. It just wasn't even close. And um, so that means Mond has to take a giant step forward. And like I said, I don't really see a reason to a reason to think that that's going to happen. So yeah, it, it, but it was it was interesting. I mean, because when when the article came out about came out about Mond, everybody on Gator Twitter was certainly interested in it, and and it got a big response from people when when I retweeted it. So I was like, yeah, let's take a look. Maybe there's some legitimacy to it. And um, I think everybody's initial thoughts on it were pretty accurate in terms of <laughs> in terms of uh, in terms of its validity. Well, and I, I pulled it up, Will, just because I, I was interested in maybe seeing how some other people uh, see this. But 24-7 put out their uh, – Barton Simmons from 24-7 Sports put out their SEC QB rankings. Um, KJ, Cost, KJ Costello, the transfer from Stanford at Mississippi State, put him at number one. Uh, now, I know Mike Leach that has a quarterback-friendly system – I guess I want to know how you're ranking this because if you're going to rank it based on pure stats, okay, maybe he can be what you would perceive the best quarterback in the SEC if you're basing it on stats. KJ Costello is not going to be the best quarterback in the SEC next year. I I, I don't care if he throws for 5,000 yards. <laughs> it, 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 it'd be for 5,000 yards. And, and he and, might. And he might. And they'll still be 6-6. Six and six. So I mean, I mean, it's just it's just the way the, the way it's going to be. No, uh, no, I am over exaggerating a little bit. Yeah, he could throw for thirty five hundred yards, and you know what? I'm sorry, it's not that does not mean he's going to be the best quarterback in the SEC just because of looking at stats uh, like that. Uh, Barton Simmons, twenty four seven Sports, Jamie Newman, uh, number two, the Wake Forest transfer, of course, uh, Georgia, 
Sorry, I still don't see it to be that high. I think he'll be in the top half of the SEC, uh, maybe the top third, but I, no. Sorry. Uh, Will, 24-7 sports. Kill him on number three. <laughs> and then Kyle Trask uh, at number four. So it, it, the, the, the thought is out there uh, from not just Jordan Rogers, of course, uh, that to overlook Kyle Trask and, and put other quarterbacks ahead. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting. One of the things that, that I've been surprised with when I've gone back and looked at quarterbacks is that accuracy doesn't look to be a learned characteristic. It looks to be a skill. And I think people look at quarterbacks and they see a guy with a giant arm and, and a guy who can really run. And they say, hey, if we could just teach this guy to read defenses and, and anticipate the throw and get it to the right spot, wow, look at the skills that he has. And, and, then, and then you put the guy out there and it just doesn't work that way because um, it's it, – a guy who has a rocket for an arm, that is a skill. A guy who can read defense as well and get the ball in the right place and can anticipate a guy coming open, that is a skill. And and I don't, especially in college football, where the windows are a lot wider, I actually think the anticipation of the throws is, is more critical than having a giant arm. And so I look at Mon's skill set, his ability to run, and his arm strength, I think, is superior to Trask. But I think Trask has the other side where his ability to read defenses, his ability to anticipate, his ability to get the ball in the right spot is something that's, that he's shown is, is better than what Mont has thus far. Um, now, I think when, when you look at guys at the NFL level, I think it's different because the windows are closer. That's actually something that I think is, is going to be fascinating about Joe Burrow because coming into last year, two years ago when I was looking at him, the real – kickback for me the thing that i questioned was did he have the arm strength to be successful and it turns out in college he had zero problem with that but i do wonder is the anticipation and his ability to go to the right read going to be enough when he needs to fit something into tight windows but at the college level i i, I think the most important skill is being able to get the ball in your playmaker's hands where where he's open and when you see an offense where the receivers are catching the ball wide open all the time i think that's a reflection on the quarterback making sure that he gets the ball to the right guy all the time and uh trash last year at least was able to show he was able to do that yeah will and i will and i will have plenty of time here on gators breakdown to, to break down sec quarterbacks but uh any final thoughts from you as you know trask mon and uh, other quarterbacks in the sec well i mean if anybody can ruin joe burrow it's the cincinnati Bengals. So. <laughs> um but but i'll say this like you know i think i think mon still gets the jimbo fisher bump and it's weird because like yeah there's not a Dan Mullen bump, I guess. <laughs> Even though Mullen's quarterback resume is probably favorable to, to Fisher, they both have good quarterback resumes. I, I just think Mullen's is a little bit better. Um, and it, that that's interesting to me. Like, So Mon profile is kind of like EJ Manuel, but by year two, in, and that's not just something I made up. That's like in NFL draft scouting reports. Um, but by year two, playing for Fisher as a starter, Manuel had made a pretty significant leap and, and we'll touch on some of it. I mean, Mon's yards per attempt were down last year. His completion percentage did jump up a little bit, but you know, it wasn't the substantive leap you'd expect for a second year return starter under Jimbo Fisher. Oh, well, is it naturally going to be better in year three? That's not always how it works. So that's kind of my thought on it. I think a lot of it is this expected leap under Jimbo Fisher coupled with the skill set. And, you know, for me, uh, I don't know if that's enough to, to put him ahead of a guy like Kyle Trask. You threw for 3,000 yards and 10 starts. Well, and let's be honest, they're still getting destroyed by Alabama, LSU, and and and, and Auburn. So, <laughs> so I'm not I'm not even, you know, even if you made a case that he's the best quarterback in the SEC, it's not going to matter because they're still going to get – Still going to get trounced by the big boy, big boys over there, you would expect. Neil, quickly, quickly, before we go, man, uh, of course, you're also uh, host, co-host of uh, Florida Basketball Hour yeah. uh, there. So quick uh, little basketball update, of course, some, some big news in the last week for some returning players before uh, you get off here on uh, Gators Breakdown. Everybody out there, if you want Gator basketball coverage as well, there's no better podcast out there than Florida <laughs> Basketball Hour uh, and Neil uh, and put and put and putting that together uh, as well. Thank you, Dave. Uh, yeah, um, you know Keontae Johnson back, first team All SEC player coming back for another season. I don't want to say it's rare, but it doesn't happen all the time. Certainly, uh, 
you know, we saw that Tennessee was able to, to reap dividends from, from that happening uh, a couple years ago when, when Admiral Schofield and, and Grant Williams decided to come back. Uh, Florida getting Keontae back, getting Scotty Lewis back, a couple of guys who could go in the first round of the NBA draft next year if they, if they make leaps. Um, you know, I know Gators Twitter is pumped that, that El Blanco, Mike White, will also be back. I'm sure they're all fired up about that. And uh, I do think that Andrew Nimbard will announce his return um, sometime in the next week. I'm not sure what his timeline is because nobody really knows everything with the coronavirus. It's hard to get in touch with anybody. But I, I think the tea leaves are pointing to Nimbard coming back. So it kind of means two things real quick. It means uh, huge preseason hype and expectations again. Um, and, you know, for those that want a referendum on, on Michael White at Florida, I think they get it next year. You get what you're asking for. So the question is, if they underperform next year, are you going to lead the, uh, the protest in the Plaza of the Americas? <laughs> I don't think I'm going to – I'm not going to – I'm not going to pass around the petition. I might stop and, and get me a Krishna lunch and, and laugh about the, uh, <laughs> the, the petition a little bit. But I do think, you know, Scott Strickland, it's so funny because – you know, in everything else, Scott Strickland is the greatest athletic director to ever walk the face of the earth. And so, like, when the Mike White debate happens, usually their answer is like, well, he just must not care much about basketball. And it's like, yeah, you're right. He doesn't care about the, the other huge revenue sport at the university. <laughs> that must be it. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think you get your referendum on Michael White next year. And, and the Keontae returns information is uh, – you know, big piece of that. So Florida's going to be the deepest team that Mike White's had with Keontae back, and they'll be the most athletic team. And and Mike White, you know, needs to cash in on that. All right, yeah, yeah. The good basketball talk there with uh, Neil Blackman, Eric Fawcett, of course, uh, as well for uh, Florida Basketball Hour. Uh, Will, anything else coming up on Read Reaction anytime soon? Yeah, I think I'm going to be taking a look at Jamie Newman next. So let's rile up the <laughs> Georgia Hive and, uh, and and see what's coming this year. Yep, I know uh, that should get passed around pretty good. There's a lot of a lot of the a lot of your Georgia stuff get, does get passed around uh, pretty good from from their side. So uh, should be should be a lot of fun, a lot of fun stuff there. Neil, uh, anything else coming up, man, from you on Saturday down south with uh, uh, Florida football? You know, uh, not a t- just just doing round tables right now, man. Just trying to. To, to fill out some content while this weird time in sports uh, passes us by. But, yeah, big big story on Wilbur Marshall coming up in a, in a couple of weeks. Um, talked to a lot of people about kind of the, the forgotten man on the Ring of Honor. So I hope people check that out. Awesome, awesome. Uh, Neil, we'll have to bring you back on, man. Uh, uh, Will and I have kind of – outline Gators breakdown for the next hopefully couple few months here and we'll be, we'll yeah. take a look back at all the uh, national championship seasons uh for the Gators uh in, in football and also you know probably some big games uh out there too not necessarily in national championship years but you know I think you and I would love to relive that 2002 Florida Georgia game so I yeah, think we'll, sure. <laughs> we'll we'll do that one for sure so uh all right for Will Miles and, and Neil Blackman I'm the host of Gators breakdown David Waters you can find me on Twitter at Gator Dave underscore SEC. Guys and girls out there, thanks for listening to this episode of Gators Breakdown.